Hi, welcome to Exploring Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 144, Free Will, Refuting Roy Baumeister's Slate.com Defense, Part 5. We've already done four parts on this, and like, I'm going to devote this show and the next show to it, and then I'm just going to move on, because like, you know, it's just, you know, <laughs> six episodes is enough to devote to an article. All right, it's an article, Baumeister, who's a psychologist at Florida State, I believe, uh, published on September 26th in the um, internet magazine called Slate, slate.com, and it's called, Do You Really Have Free Will? Okay, so you can, you know, you can check out the article, and actually, I wrote a lot of comments, you know, kind of like refuting his arguments there, so, you know, check those out. All right, so anyway, we're, we're going to take off from where we left off last time on the last episode. And basically, um, Baumeister was saying that, um, that the arguments that scientists use to refute free will generally leave untouched the meaning of free will. I'm paraphrasing. That, that means, for example, um, accepting responsibility for one's actions. Okay. Um, it's not, you know, an argument that's left out by the scientists, psychologists who refute free will. It's actually a logical extension of there not being a free will. Okay, the, the way to explain this is um, there's two ways to kind of like define free will. The first is in terms of causality. The second is in terms of moral responsibility. So with causality, is like if we could do things that were free of factors that are not in our control, actually it's more about control than causality, whatever, then, um, then we would have a free will, okay, if we could do that. But because this process of cause and effect that basically leads to everything that happens, you know, in the world, it's not just us, it's everything, because, you know, that determines everything, that's why we don't have free will. <laughs> Um, but the second reason, like, so let me explain it in terms of moral responsibility. The idea is, like, if we had free will, we would be fundamentally, and, I, you know, I have to explain this, fundamentally as opposed to pragmatically morally responsible. And the reason I say that is because, like, we don't have a free will, so we're not morally responsible, as I'll explain. But we, we have to kind of like, quote unquote, assume responsibility and, and quote unquote, hold each other responsible to maintain order and our rules and, you know, law and morality and all that stuff. But here's, here's the way it goes. Okay, so like, in other words, like, if you refute, as scientists do, you know, notwithstanding Baumeister's claims, free will based on <coughs> the issue of control that if you don't have control, conscious control, over your actions, <clears throat> then you don't have a free will. Well, if you don't have conscious controls over your ap action, you're really not morally responsible for them fundamentally. Let me explain this. If you do something wrong, all right, in the eyes of the, the law, that, that still, this, is, this relates to it. In the eyes of the law, you kind of would be in a certain sense because you're the identifiable person who did whatever they did. But here's an example. Let's say somebody took you and abducted you and, you know, you know, <laughs> implanted a, an electrode in your brain or something. I don't know. And then you went out around and did stuff that was wrong, okay? It'd be wrong, right? But since you weren't, wouldn't be in control of it, because like with this electrode, the, your abductors are controlling your thoughts and your behavior. You're kind of like a robot or something, whatever. You know, you can't be held fundamentally morally responsible for what you're not in control of, okay? Um, this is recognized by the law, incidentally. Um, well, it's related to, like, the insanity defense, and if you can't really understand the charges against you, and if you can't understand that what you did was wrong, then, you know, you're not completely culp culpable or whatever. That, that's a bit different. But the idea is that... Um, that in the law, yeah, they account for that. And then that's, sometimes it's not an excuse. Sometimes, like, if you get inebriated, whatever, you know, really drunk or whatever, and then you go out and do something wrong, and you're not really aware of what you did because, like, you were under the influence, the control of the, um, 
the alcohol. That's not really a, an excuse. But th we're talking about like, you know, this causality, the refutes free will. It's like you can't you can't do anything about it. It just like it, it just like it is controlling you. We're, we're all controlled. Everything I'm saying now, everything you're hearing, everything that happens, it's all controlled. I mean, it's all it's all the the the, the end product of this causal chain, the cause and effect, or whatever that goes back to the Big Bang. All right, so, so the idea is that um, because of that, again, like the scientists don't deal with the, the issue of moral responsibility directly because it's an obvious correlate of refuting free will. If you refute free will, you've refuted fundamental personal moral responsibility. Now, I say personal because there's another distinction we want to make. Okay, so like we do something wrong, right? And it's really not our fault because we don't have a free will, okay? And that, you know, and I'm, that's not to say that we can go around doing stuff wrong and then claim it's not our fault, you know, because like, again, like I said before, we got to hold each other responsible pragmatically. But, all right, see, what happens is if, if we do something wrong, the wrongs will have been done. It's kind of like, there is moral responsibility there, but it doesn't lie with us. So then you ask, well, who or what does it lie with? All right, if you want to like, if you want to like, look at this question theologically, it lies with God. I mean, like, you know, the other thing is like, yeah, if God, one way to explain it is like, if God made us, right, God is responsible for what we do. And I want to explain this because this is a good explanation. Let's say you're a, um, a scientist and you create a robot, okay? And um, and let's say magically, you can't do this, you know. But let's say magically you can endow the robot with free will, okay? So the robot, you know, you, you take him outside for a walk, whatever. He escapes and he starts committing crimes, okay? So, um, again, you endowed this robot with free will. Escaped, starts committing crimes. He gets caught, and you get caught. You know, so like you're up before a judge, right? And you're saying to the judge, listen, you can't blame me because I created this robot, but I gave him free will. He did what he did out of his own free will. That's, that's not a defense anyhow because, like, who do you think the the judge is going to like sentence? You think the, you think the judge is going to let you off for like doing that? The judge is going to say, "Listen, I, I understand that you gave the the robot free will, but you created the robot, and he wouldn't have gone out and committed all those crimes if you hadn't created him. So you created him in a way that fine, granted him free will. Again, that, that whole notion is inco is incoherent. But if you were to be able to do that, you grant them free will." The judge is going to hold the scientist responsible, okay? And the same, you know, so you take that analogy and apply it to God or the universe, whatever. And what you come up with is that, like, we human beings are not fundamentally morally responsible. We, we don't have a free will, and we didn't create ourselves. So, um, <coughs> so God or the universe, it's is who or what is fundamentally responsible. Now, that actually presents even a, um, an interesting conundrum, a paradox, a puzzle. It's like not solvable in, in logic, because like, I'm religious in a way, I'm pantheistic more so than, in other words, I believe that God <coughs> and the universe are synonymous. Okay, so like, if, if God is everything, well, the universe is everything, okay? If God is all-powerful, well, the universe has these laws of nature that are all-powerful, causality being one of them. So, the idea is, um, let's say, you know, I want to, because I'm religious in that way, I want to try to absolve God or the universe. And it doesn't make complete sense. I'll have to acknowledge that. I have to admit that. It's not a completely satisfying answer. But... You know, it works to a certain extent. Okay, so what happens is like, so you've got this chain of cause and effect that is going back from whatever you did wrong. Let's say you did something wrong, okay? Something immoral. And, you know, there was a cause for that 
decision, that act, and then there was cause for that cause and a cause to that cause, and these causes are regressing back moment by moment, whether you describe them as, you know, states of the, of the universe regressing backward moment by moment, or however you want to describe it, this chain of cause and effect, ultimately it's going to go back to the Big Bang, all right? So like, you know, according to science, science can't really make any kinds of conclusions or assertions or hypotheses, maybe hypotheses, but there's no theory, whatever, of what happens before the Big Bang because we just don't have that information. You know, we have no idea what happened. But, but if we want to kind of like address this using reason or logic, um, <laughs> that would tell you that like, well, you know, actually this is like according to like one of the um, laws of physics is conservation of mass energy. Mass energy, matter, stuff, you can't either create or destroy mass energy. You can't either create or destroy what's physical, what's real. Okay, so you've got this big bang that like 13.7 billion years ago was like the size of a less than the size of a pea, apparently. I mean, that's amazing. That in, you know, all these galaxies, these billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars, you know, <laughs> condensed to the size, <laughs> less than the size. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling. All right, so like, anyway, so like, you've got this, this, all this matter there. Again, according to this law of conservation of mass energy, it couldn't have just arisen something from nothing. You know, so then you, you say to yourself, well, there must have been, there must have been a cause to the Big Bang. And, you know, they, they speculate it might have been like that there's kind of like that there's a, a Big Bang and then there's a big crunch where everything just sucks back into the singularity and then it bangs again. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a cycle of, of Big Bangs and Big Crunches. That, that's possible. Who knows? But the idea is like this chain of cause and effect behind every act that we do behind every immoral act in this case before behind our moral act keeps going back and like logically it just never stops going back okay so like so in other words like when you ask you ask well who 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 can we hold what can we hold morally responsible for this like this immoral thing that, that a person may have done did um in a certain sense, you can't hold anything responsible. Because how can you do, like, I mean, you can, you can hold the quote-unquote causal chain responsible, but if it's going to go back eternally into the past and never stop going back, and yes, that concept transcends our, our logic, our reasoning. We can't, we can't either conceive, because if, if we try to conceive of something like going back to a certain point, like the Big Bang or like a point before that, Naturally, we're going to ask, well, yeah, well, well, that didn't create itself. What came before that? All right, so you've got this, this prospect of a chain of cause and effect going indefinitely, eternally back into the past, regressing. So that's a way to absolve God or the universe if we want to. Again, it's not completely satisfying, but all right, onward. So that's, that's why we don't have moral... That's why we're not fundamentally morally responsible, even though we accept pragmatic moral responsibility and hold others pragmatically responsible. And, and again, scientists do refute this, but they don't refute it directly because it's such an obvious consequence of our not having a free will. All right. <sighs> okay, sorry. Um, all right, Baumeister, his next point is like, I'm going to quote this. I, I'm not going to quote too much of this stuff. You know, I'm going to basically paraphrase, but this, this is quotable. All right. There is a genuine, genuine psychological reality behind the idea of free will. Listen, there is a genuine psyche, psychological reality behind the idea of free will. Yes, he's absolutely correct about that. That psychological reality is called an illusion, okay? <laughs> In psychology, an illusion is something that we think is there, but it's not. You know, you look out into the, like, you're traveling, like, let's say, in the desert or on a, a long, straight road in the summer, right? And you look out into the horizon, and you can swear there's water there, you know, like, you swear it's all shimmering wet and stuff. You get there, you finally never, you know, you never get to the water because it's a mirage. It's an illusion. It's, so, like, so, yes, 
free will is a genuine psychological reality as an illusion, but it's not a genuine reality as a fact of reality. You know, illusions are not facts. Okay. So, all right, we got that. All right. Um, so now he, he makes another kind of statement. He's trying to, like, this, this statement that he makes, it's, it's, it's on, I mean, like, Baumeister is a psychologist. He's, he's supposed to know what causality is, the implications of causality, but, but this statement that he makes just kind of, like, suggests that he doesn't, because, like, he's a, I think he's a compatibilist. Compatibilist psychologists, philosophers, they claim, yes, everything is causal, everything has a cause, but we still have free will. So, and that is completely, you know, like, Kant called that a, um, a wretched subterfuge, I think, and William James, the father of American psychology, called it um, um, a quagmire of, of evasion. Okay, so like, you know, it, it just, it's, it's an incomprehensible, nonsensical perspective. But anyway, so like Baumeister says, I, I can quote this again, Free will is just another kind of cause. What do you mean, just another kind of cause? He, what he doesn't understand, and I don't understand why he doesn't understand, is I'll get to this after I make this point. I'll try to explain why he, why he doesn't understand, because I think it's kind of like, I think it's obvious in a way. All right. If free will were just another kind of cause, I mean, first of all, another. A cause is a cause. There is, you know, there's, there aren't, I mean, there are different kinds of causes per se, but it's all, they're all causes. And because they're all causes, they have causes because everything is caused. So you can't escape this, um, this chain of causality. So if Baumeister is going to define free will as a kind of cause, he's got to acknowledge, if he understands the principle and process of causality, that that free will with it would have a cause, and there would be a cause to the cause of that free will, and a cause to the cause of that free will, and these causes would regress back in time to before the person doing whatever, you know, is asserted to be freely willed did, was born before the planet was created, before the, you know, up to the Big Bang and before that. So that's, you know... So, like, saying the free will is a cause, you know, if you understand causality, is no defense of free will because, like, you can call it a cause, but, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, if, it, if it's a cause, it's, that, that statement then is, is incoherent because, like, basically free will would mean, really, free from causality, free from any factor over which we're not in control. We're not in control over this causal chain of events that preceded our birth. We can't have been con in control of that. Okay, why doesn't Baumeister get this? I've been thinking about this because, you know, I mean, our whole world is deluded about this, and a lot of academics are deluded. And here's, here's my answer. There's two answers. One is, is kind of like well-known in the literature, in the, the psychology literature. It's this, um, this concept of motivated reasoning. You know, sometimes... When we're confronted by facts that threaten our deeply held, deeply cherished, perhaps deeply needed notions of reality, like for some people, the, the idea that, like, that Adam and Eve were the first people on Earth, you know, evolution challenged that very, very strongly, powerfully. Like this, this, this belief in free will or the, the, the understanding that free will is an illusion, that's very challenging to people who need to believe in free will because like otherwise they don't know how their life could have meaning you know or or, or they think the the social order is going to collapse or whatever but um so that's that's called motivated reasoning and it's a bias we have in other words our our emotional needs wants preferences attitudes beliefs hijack our reasoning you know they trump our reasoning and you know they don't allow us to understand stuff that we'd otherwise be able to understand you know, were not for this stuff. So that's part of it. That, I think it explains a lot of it. I think another explanation is, is perhaps a bit more telling. I think, you know, I think in academia especially, I think in life in general, but in academia especially, 
there are two fundamental kinds of intelligences. Um, two kinds of people. I mean, like, you know, there's some people, for example, who have IQ intelligence. Let's say they have a high IQ intelligence. In a lot of cases, they'll have a low social intelligence score. In other words, they'll know how to understand facts and concepts enough and stuff, but they won't know how to read people very well. They won't know how to read social interactions. A lot of times when you have a strong IQ, you'll have a weak social IQ and vice versa. So like with this in academia, there seem to be two kinds of people. The first kind, which, which I think represents Baumeister and people who believe in free will, these people are very good at learning information, <coughs> okay? And then they're very good at remembering that information. And then they're very good at recalling the information, like for tests, you know, to demonstrate that they learned and then they've memorized information. But they're not very good at understanding what they've learned. <coughs> That's the key. In other words, like, Baumeister learned this concept of causality, cause and effect, but he doesn't understand it really, because if he did, he would, he would understand how completely it makes free will impossible. Okay, so like, so there, that's the, the first kind. Um, the second kind kind of explains the, the scientists, the um, philosophers, the people who get the free will is an illusion. They may not be able to learn as well. Maybe, may, may, maybe, maybe not, who knows. They may not be able to remember what they learned as well or re recall it for tests and all. But they, they know how to understand what they've learned. Okay, so, like, so this whole concept of free will, it's, it's about understanding. It's not about like learning the mistakes that people in the past have, have, you know, have, have made about the issue, because most of the writers on free will have, have believed that it exists. You know. it, it's about understanding why it doesn't exist. So anyway, that, that, that I think explains why Baumeister and, and um, a lot of academics. And the, the other thing is like, the reason they're able to get their PhDs and, 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 and you know, thrive within academia is because um, most of academia is structured on learn, remember, recall, and then apply what you've learned, okay? That's, that's what education to a great extent is about. It's not so much about understanding what you've learned. In, in physics, there is like the, the shut up and calculate, they, that's what they called it, school, where like, you know, they didn't want the physicists to try to like ask questions about what, you know, what they were learning. They just wanted them to do the equations, the mathematics, and get the right answers. Okay? All right. So, what else? We got about, yeah, and I'm not going to get through all this, and that's all right. Because like six episodes, that's a lot. There's a lot of my, you know, that's fine. Okay, now he, then he makes, the, he makes the, um, the case that like, you know, a person deciding to get married has different kinds of causes than a ball rolling downhill. Yes, absolutely. But, but you got to understand that the person's decision to get married, our brains are physical. Our neurons are physical. The process of causality is a physical process. So while there may be different in the sense that like what causes the, the ball to roll, roll down a hill is simple momentum or perhaps gravity and momentum, you know, the, uh, the, the, the causes to which person a person decides to marry are different. They're psychological. But actually, most fundamentally, you want to you know, get really real about this. The cause to both of those is the same. Okay, it's the state of the universe. You know, the ball is rolling, all right? So, or the person is deciding who to marry. The cause of both of those actions is the state of the universe <coughs> at the moment prior to that. Because, like, you know, I've explained this in, in, in shows in the past. You can use the state of the universe explanation to, to, as the most comprehensive, most general, most precise 
causal explanation to anything. A lot of people say, well, you can't know what causes stuff, so how could you say it's caused? We do know what causes stuff. It's always the universe, okay? Stay the universe. The Big Bang, okay, the first moment of the universe, completely caused the second moment. The second moment completely caused the third, because that's, again, how do we know this? Because the universe is all there was to completely cause the next state of the universe, right? So you follow that chain of causality, it comes to the present moment, and nothing that we can do, a ball can't roll and a person can't decide whom to marry, you know, outside of this universe, outside of this causal progression of the universe. All right, we've got like a minute and 36 seconds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a commercial because I think, you know, I want to stop here. And, you know, I'll, I'll finish off. I'm not going to get to a lot of it, but that's all right. Six episodes, that's like a lot to devote to this stuff. I do, this show, this show is like on in White Plains at 7.30 on Thursday nights, and I mean on Wednesday nights, and at 9 o'clock on Thursdays, okay? But I also upload all these episodes to the internet if you're watching this on TV. And a lot of my shows were with my former co-host are aired in Manhattan on their Manhattan neighborhood network, you know, that goes out to like, there's about half a million subscribers. I don't know how many people watch the show, but there's a big potential audience and um, and then like sometimes like um, on Wednesday I mean you're gonna be seeing this like sometime in November it's it's oh yeah it's it's October 21st you know so I'm, I'm you know I'm pretty ahead with the with the whatever but anyway in a couple days from from the day I'm taping this I'm, I'm going to Manhattan we're gonna do the show live so anyway like so, you know, and then there's our, our website, Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, okay, causalconsciousness.com. You can, like, check out the shows and a lot more information designed to explain to you why we don't have a free will and why it matters, because, like, it really matters. Like, after I do the, the last show on Baumeister, I'm going to do a, um, an off-the-cuff. I haven't done one in a while. It'll be off-the-cuff number 10. And I'm just going to talk about, like, why this matters, because, like, I'm not sure what I'm going to say, but it should be interesting. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Thanks.